السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ توحید و سنت ڈاٹ کام الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا محمد و علی آلہ و اصحابہ و ازواجہ و من تبعہم بحسان الى یوم الدین اما بعد In the previous session of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we talked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arriving in Medina Munawwara and staying with Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu and then we talked about some of the things that happened during those seven months that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the house of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. As we know the reason for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to station in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu was that his camel was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and accordingly came and sat on an open land in front of that house. So the place where his camel sat, <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered the owners of that land to buy it from them and build a masjid over there. That land belonged to two orphans in Medina Munawwara. Their name was Sahal, ibn Suhail, uh, Sahal and Suhail. There were two brothers, one Sahal and the other brother's name was Suhail. Their father whose name was Amr, had passed away earlier, and they were orphans under the guardianship of As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu. As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu, as we know and we talked about it earlier, that he had established prayers in Medina Munawwara before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had arrived Medina Munawwara, and very surprisingly he chose the very same place for offering the prayers in the same land that later on where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built his masjid. So Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een before the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina Munawwara they used to perform salah with jama'ah at the very same place in the land of Sahal and Suhail radiallahu anhuma, they were young boys and Asad bin Zurara was there. Uh, uh, he had the uh, responsibility of taking care of all of their assets and properties and everything. So uh, he uh, was using that land for performing the salah. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called the people, they both were from a clan called Bani Najjar, a well-known clan in Medina Munawwara. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called the people of Banu Najjar and said to them, Thaminuni ha'itakum hada. I would like to buy this land, this piece of land that is yours. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry about the price. You just go ahead and do whatever you like to do with it. It's yours and we don't need no price for it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no. Tell me who are the owners of it. They said, Ya Rasulullah, these are the two young people. So he called the two young people and he called their guardian also, which was As'ad bin Zurara, who was As'ad bin Zurara radiallahu anhu. And they also offered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take it for free. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refused to take it for free. The next step was, they, some of the people of Ansar, offered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah you don't worry about it we will pay these children the price of it Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no I don't want to do that I would like to make the deal and then regardless of where I get the money from which means he will be collecting it from the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam anyway and it may be the very same people will come and give it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will hand it over to these two orphans but he did not want to be out of the deal and find out later on that they were not paid the full price or in the negotiation there were misunderstandings or anything like this. He wanted to finalize the deal himself. 
So finally, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the deal with those young people and paid the full price of that land and then they started constructing the masjid in that land. Before going any further with that construction of the masjid, just a quick reminder here as we see how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with this situation, it was very important, very important for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be careful with his actions, especially at this stage. He have just arrived Medina Munawwara, and subhanAllah, he have set some beautiful examples there. One is, they wanted to offer Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that land for free, and he refused to take it. See, the point is, that he have just arrived Medina Munawwara and now whenever he would ask about something who is this I would like to buy and the person would offer him that thing for free it would become difficult for him later on that he cannot even ask about anything if he would ask about anything it will be just like asking for it and which is not proper from the Sharia point of view so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this beautiful example that no, I'm not going to just take everything for free. And then whenever I like something, the owner of that thing has to give it to me for free. Now, some people would love to give it for free. In fact, most of them. But there might be someone who is in need of some money. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked about something and he says, no, don't take it for free. In fact, subhanallah, the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with these situations was very unique, very unique with the type of status Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had that people would like to just offer him anything and everything. Imagine, as we inshallah will talk about it later, that Sahaba offering some other Sahaba, their properties, their homes, their businesses, everything. So imagine how much they were willing to give Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all can very well understand. Today we feel, oh, I wish I can give everything that belongs to me to Prophet ﷺ. That will be an honor for us. That if he would accept it, if he would accept it from us. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't want to do that. As I said, in fact, he set some totally opposite example for us to that, and that is, Jabir radiyallahu anhu says, once we were traveling. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized that my camel is going very slow. He asked me, what happened to your camel Jabir? I said, Ya Rasulullah is getting too tired and sick. It's very slow Ya Rasulullah. I don't know what to do with it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made some dua for the camel. And the camel started going faster than all other camels. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, because of that now I started just keeping my camel next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's camel. So, while I'm walking with him, he asked me, Jabir, would you like to sell your camel? I said, sure, ya Rasulullah. If you would like to buy it, yes, I would sell it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me what would be the price for it. And we fixed a price. Of course, Jabir radiallahu anhu doesn't want to take no money from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they know his habit that when he's asking for something, he would like to pay for it. This is, I always learn from our scholars, from my teachers, people that I've been being around, that when they ask for something, they always love to pay for it. They always want to pay for it. And we really should, especially those of us who are working in the field of deen and the da'wah or anything like this, and we may have any that type of relationship with some other people, we should always make sure that from those people especially, if we are getting anything, pay for it. And that will have a long-lasting effect on the work that you are doing. Inshallah, I'll mention something about it later on. Coming back to Jabir radiallahu anhu, that he has no choice but to make that deal with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he doesn't ask for a prize and he says, no, I don't want the money, then he doesn't want to buy it. So, if I'm asking for it, yes, you come and give it to me as a gift, I'll take it. But that is before I asked you for it. But now I ask the prize, and then you come and say to me that, here, take it as a gift. This is for me just like begging, just like asking for it. So, they fixed the price. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jabir, 
Now, we just, because we are on our way, so use your camel until we get back to Medina Munawwara. Subhanallah. This is the first example that we find here, beautiful example, that after buying it, now he is saying, use it until we get back. You buy a car from someone, and you tell him, okay, you keep on traveling with it. When you come back, you know, when we go back to our town, then you give me the car. <coughs> Who would do that? You buy something, you would like to have the ownership of it right away. Now, the next thing is even more surprising. They arrived, Madina Munawwara. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paid me in full. When I went and took the camel to him, gave, gave him the camel, he says, Jabir, keep the camel, I don't want it. Look at this example. He's paying for it. He paid him the full price for it, never used it, let him use it from the time he bought it until now, and when he comes to give him that camel, he says, you keep it. This is the example that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said for us. That he's, he always loves to give. It's not that he loves to just take. He loves to give. And then especially with this type of situation, where he is teaching people, if he's just taking things, gradually there will be some people who may think, you know, he just wants to collect it. He just wants to collect these things from us. So, he is being very careful not to just take. In fact, it was his habit. When he receives a gift, he gives another gift also. In, in return, some other time, he will give that person some gifts also. So, these are beautiful examples uh, in the seerah that we learn from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a land. Normally no one would give others his land. So after he asked for it, they're saying, take it for free. He says, no, I'm not going to take it for free. And they insisted, they tried their best. The whole clan is trying. And those young people who are the owners of the land, they're trying. Their guardian is trying. And now some other people are trying the other way. Look at the second thing now, second choice. That we will pay them for uh, the price of it. Ya Rasulullah, you don't worry about it. You just take it and we will make a deal with them. He said, no, no, no. I don't want to take it that way. I want to make the deal. I want to fix the price. And I want to pay them. Now, of course, as far as where I'm going to get the money from, it will be, you people will be giving it to me, donations, that's different for the masjid. But as far as dealing with these people, I'm going to deal with them. Otherwise, those young people may say later on, no, we don't want the money, and these people, some of them will say, okay, you know, since they're insisting, that's fine, we won't take the money from them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't want none of these things to happen. So anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he bought that land. After buying it, they continued praying, but they built a small shed over there where they would start praying officially now as a masjid. And at the same time, they started the construction of a larger masjid over there. Initially, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bought it, there were a lot of graves over there. These graves were from the days of Jahiliyyah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the Sahaba Rizwanullahi alayhi wa jama'in to take their bodies out, those bodies out and go and bury them somewhere else. Take them out of this land. And... There was a lot of trash, a lot of other things in that land. They all, they cleaned all of that. Then they started the construction of the masjid at that place. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that when they started the construction of the masjid, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put the first stone with his own blessed hand. And then he asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to bring one and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu put the second stone. Then he asked Umar radiallahu anhu to bring the third one. Umar radiallahu anhu put the third stone. Then he asked Usman radiallahu anhu to bring the fourth one and Usman radiallahu anhu put the fourth stone. Fourth stone. Aisha radiallahu anhu says, as the hadith narrated in Abi Ya'la, Musnad Abi Ya'la, we asked, uh, Sahaba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, what was the reason for this order? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, said, this will be the order after me. Indicating towards the khilafah of these people. These sahaba radhwanullahi alayhi wa sallam. And 
then the construction started. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was working with the Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi wa and just like any other Sahaba, and he was reciting a poem, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirah. Ya Allah, the real life is the life of the hereafter. Farham al-ansara wal-muhajira, have mercy on the ansar and the muhajireen. So he was making dua for all the people that are working, and at the same time they are working. Another example and beautiful lesson for us, that when we are doing this type of work, our tongue should always be busy in the dua, in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we learn from Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam. Also, when they built uh, the Kaaba, Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu wassalam, they were making dua, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta sami'ul alim. Ya Allah, accept this from us. You are the hearer, the knower, and the rest of the dua that has been mentioned over there. Usayyid bin Hudayr radiyallahu anhu says that I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam carrying some hay stones. So I wanted to help him with it and asked him to give it to me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's response was, Usayyid, you don't want reward more than I do. I, knew I need the reward as much as you need it. So if you really are looking for it, don't take it from me. Don't take my reward. Go and bring another stone from there. And this is how he was encouraging Sahaba Ridwanullah to do the work, showing them that we all are doing this work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we will get our reward according to how much work and effort we will put in here. Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhu did a very unique thing while they were constructing the masjid. All the people, of course, are doing their hard work and they're working as hard as they could. But everyone saw Ammar radiallahu anhu carrying two stones instead of one. So every person is bringing one stone or a rock, whatever that was, and Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhu is carrying two. Someone asked him, Ammar, why are you uh, working so hard and why, you are, uh, why would you carry two at a time? Carry one at a time so that you won't be so tired. He said, I'm carrying with the intention, one is for me and one I'm carrying on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Although Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is working himself, but Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhu still wants to do some additional work on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that the reward of it will be to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, this is his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that while he's doing the work and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing it, he still wants to do more on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was a Sahabi, Talq bin Ali radiallahu anhu, one of the well-known Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi wa He says, when we were working, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, Talq, I will assign the mixing of the concrete to you. And Talq radiallahu anhu says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was watching us very carefully when we were working, so we were taking turns and picking the bricks. When a person is tired, then he would go and start mixing some of the concrete and uh, mud. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was very carefully, he's doing the work at the same time, he's carefully watching us, and seeing who is able to do which type of work better than others. And Tal says, I, this was my profession, mixing the concrete and these things. And he noticed me that I was doing that work better than others. So he said to me, Talq, you are not going to carry the, uh, the bricks anymore. You just stay over here and keep on doing this work. And this is something that we really find in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a lot. That he used to keep an eye on people's abilities. That who does what type of work? When people are doing anything, he would watch them. And although he seems to be busy doing something else, but at the same time, he is watching what these people are doing. And then he would use those abilities at the right time. Many times people didn't even know that he knows what I'm doing. Or he's noticing it. He was noticing, subhanAllah, uh, he was noticing things so carefully that many times Sahaba Ridwanullah were amazed that how did he notice this, how did he know that I have done it in this way. Another example of it, this is Taq bin Ali mentioning this example that 
uh, when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam assigned the mix mixing of the concrete and the mud to him, and he says that was my profession, and he saw me doing it better than others. In fact, then he told the other Sahaba, he said, try to make this uh, talk. He says, uh, he, and he was from uh, Yamama. So he said, make that person from Yamama mix the concrete. He's doing it very well. He's doing that very professionally. And another example of it when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting with the group of Sahaba in the masjid and a person comes and he performs the salah, he comes and he says Assalamu alaykum ya Rasulullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him Irja' fa salli fa inna kalam tusalli Go back and perform the salah because you have not yet performed the salah Now, he didn't know that if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was noticing him and in fact even the other Sahaba sitting over there never realized that he is noticing all of these actions of his prayer very carefully so to the extent that now when that person comes and says salam to him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him the, all the mistakes that he have made in his salah this is how carefully he's watching him while he's talking to this group of sahaba radhwanullahi alayhi wa so this was a very unique quality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but of course it's something that any Amir a person who is a leader, a person who is in charge of some people, and especially on that level where he has to deal with a lot of people, run a country like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he should have that, uh, at least uh, uh, that ability to start looking at all of these things, watching every person, watching people's work, and looking at people's abilities, and using them at the right places. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the very similar situation he says people carry mines within them like the mines of the gold and silver so as there are some portions of land carries and have some gold and silver in it but you have to work on it you have to know where it is so people also have these mines within them and really he was putting all of these things in right use at the right time it will take us far away from our topic, otherwise I would have gone into some of these examples and the details of how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam using different sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa at different situations and positions and then they find amazing results, very amazing results of the uh, selection that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have made and of the abilities of these Sahaba Ridwanullahi Alimajma'in, such abilities that people never thought that this person could ever be of any work, but he's doing, offering such a great performance within his field that people are amazed, people are surprised, people could never believe that this person could ever do something like this. This is really something that a leadership, a person who is in the uh, situation of a leadership, they should have these abilities of using right people at the right places and having watching people under them. So anyway, Talq bin Ali radiallahu anhu was mixing the concrete and he's mixing the mud and he's uh, uh, bring, bringing it there at the site and uh, all the Sahaba radhwanullahi alayhi including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were bringing the stones and positioning, uh, building the walls of the masjid. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, now this uh, a big question came in, that was having the direction of the Qibla. So that the mihrab where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would stand, would be exactly at the direction of the Kaaba. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to the measurements they used to use in those days, whatever methods they used to use for getting the directions, they used that and he had some people standing at the corners. So they can have straight corners. So people are standing uh, at the corners of the, where the uh, corner uh, pillars will be. And then uh, from there he's going to set the uh, qibla at the middle wall, in the, in the middle of the, in that wall. So Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came and he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that instead of using these methods, I will remove all the objects between here and the qibla and you can set the qibla while you are looking at it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this is how he set his qibla. Initially, remember, the qibla was towards Baytul Maqdis because from the hijrah up to about 17 months, qibla was towards Baytul Maqdis and then 
it was changed towards Kaaba. So when the Qibla was changed towards Kaaba, again Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came and he removed all the objects between the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam up to the Kaaba. And the hadith says, which is in Muslim Ahmad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he sat his mihrab where he would stand exactly at the middle of the Kaaba where the Mizab is. Mizab means the drainage where the water falls from the Kaaba up to now. It's at the same place if you look at the picture of the Kaaba. There is one drain uh, that, that comes out of the Kaaba uh, from this roof of it and the water drops uh, from there. Uh, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam set his mihrab exactly to that direction. After they built the masjid and the Kaaba, uh, the Qibla is said, the masjid is built, Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een started building some of their houses on one side of the masjid and when they were building these houses, they were using the wall of the masjid, one, well, there will be one wall of the masjid and they will build three walls around it so that will be a whole house for that person. And they started opening the doors of their homes inside the masjid. So they would not have, of course, uh, they, uh, I'm sure they didn't even have so many uh, pillars and uh, uh, pieces of wood that to use to build so many, uh, a lot of doors and windows. So they had only one door and all of the doors to the houses were opening inside the masjid. So if any of the Sahabi and his family would like to leave their home, they would not have any way to go outside except to come in the masjid because the door would open inside the masjid, they would come in the masjid and then they will go outside, wherever they have to go. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also built two of his houses next to the masjid. One was for Sauda radiallahu anha and at that time he had only one wife Sauda radiallahu anha and later on of course he got married uh, as Khadija radiallahu anha came also came uh, uh, sorry Aisha radiallahu anha and that, that was uh, in the second year of the hijrah so then in the second house Aisha radiallahu anha was that house was given to Aisha radiallahu anha when we say the word house normally we may imagine something like our houses so we may, I mean, it's uh, important to keep it very clear that when we say a house, these were very small rooms, very small rooms that are built just next to the masjid. The masjid was about 100 by 100. This was the size of the masjid, 100 feet by 100 feet. And now the Sahaba started building on one side, towards the back side of it, and on the other side, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built two of his houses and the rest of the land on that side belonged to a Sahabi whose name was Haritha bin al-Nu'man radiyallahu anhu. As we know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam altogether had nine rooms, as we may call it, houses, nine rooms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word hujurat for them. Uh, there is a surah in Quran, Surah Al-Hujurat. These are the referring to the houses or the rooms that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had next to uh, the masjid. So altogether he had nine. Harissa bin al-Nu'man radiallahu anhu, he had that land. He never lived over there, but those uh, that uh, uh, it was designed in such a way that you can have about exactly, you can have nine houses over there. Nine rooms built next to the masjid over there. So each time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have a wife, Harissa bin al-Nu'man radiallahu anhu would give him that land as a gift. Until he gave him all nine of his land that was next to the masjid, he gave all of that to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a gift. Is a, of course, is a great honor for the Sahabi, a name that is normally not even known and talked about, but this Sahabi, of course, got a great uh, achievement and uh, really uh, got a, a lot of blessings, uh, must have got a lot of dua that uh, 
giving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all the houses that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had were given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the Sahabi Haritha bin Nu'man radiyallahu anhu. So, now Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa sallam has said they build their houses also on the other sides of the masjid. And their doors are opening inside the masjid. Finally, one day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave this instruction that no more doors are allowed to open inside the masjid. Close all the doors that open inside the masjid. And the reason for that was because inni la uhillul masjid ali ha'idhin wa la li janub. A person who is janub has to take a shower or a woman who is not clean, she cannot enter the masjid. And if the door opens only in the masjid, then and they need to, they have to leave the, uh, uh, their homes during that time. Because even the janab, they may not have enough water at home. So they have to go and get a water from a well uh, to, uh, to be able to take a shower. For uh, fulfilling the natural call, using the bathroom, they had to go out in the, into the jungle. And for that they had to leave their homes. There was no other door except inside the masjid, so they will have to come through the masjid and then walk out. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, no, it's not allowed now for any hail or janab to, uh, have their, uh, to, uh, you, to go, come in the masjid, therefore close all of your doors that open inside the masjid. <coughs> Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa they all closed their doors. But, because of their attachment to the masjid, they always like to see when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is in the masjid, what's happening in the masjid, they're very closely attached to this masjid. So, they open windows towards the masjid. So they close the doors, opening windows, and they open the door towards the other side. Just before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, he gave this next instruction, and that was, Close all the windows that are opening to the masjid with the exception of one window that was allowed to open in the masjid. That was the window of the house of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. That was an indication towards the khilafah of Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu that if all the doors, all the windows are closed and the only window that is open here now to the masjid was the window of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu and of course the doors towards the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were there. These houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were intact and they remained there until the time of Al-Walid bin Abdul Malik. During his time, he wanted to extend the masjid. Of course, there were a couple of expansions done to the masjid. Uh, once, uh, during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was somewhere around the 6th and the 7th year of the Hijrah, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized there is need to expand the masjid. So, they did some expansion to the masjid at that time. And that was the time when the land was bought through the money of Sayyidina Usman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. If you remember when Usman radiallahu anhu was surrounded and he was reminding those people of certain things just to stop them from committing a sin. He is not worried about his life. If the worry was of his life, he had the biggest army in the world and he could have taken care of those people very easily. In fact, people offered him and a lot of people insisted. Some people even got upset with him for not using the force. He said, no, it's not possible for me that because to save my life, I would shed a blood in the haram of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in the city of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not after I have heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that once the blood shedding will start in this ummah, it will never stop until the day of judgment. So I don't want to be the person who will start. If they are going to start it, let them do it. But I don't want to take that sin on my shoulders. Subhanallah, what an understanding of it and how careful these people are. Imagine a person who's ruling the superpower of his time. He can't deal with these people. Of course, he had all the abilities, all the power. They were able to, he, he was able to deal with it very easily. But no, I'm not going to, because these people at least by claim they are Muslims. I'm not going to look at anything else. In fact, once someone came and told him that 
one of their leaders is leading the Salah in the Masjid. And really I hate to perform Salah behind these people. Now these are the people who are surrounding the house of Uthman radiallahu anhu, preventing him from having any food, any drink, and uh, uh, forcing him to give up the Khilafah. And the question is about those people that the leader is leading the Salah in the Masjid. Of course, a person like us will say right away, why can't these, uh, uh, these people should have no relationship with them whatsoever. Don't even see them. Uthman radiallahu anhu's response was that the best action a person can do in his life is Salah. So when he's doing Salah at that time, he's doing a good action. Join him in Salah. Perform the Salah behind him. Don't worry about it. But when they do the evils, when they do something wrong, then stay away from it. So you don't get a sin for it. But that deed is a, that action by itself. The Salah is a good action. Perform the Salah behind them. Don't worry about it. Subhanallah. What an understanding. That, that by itself is a whole topic to study in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi wa jama'een. Kindness, understanding at the time of differences. And it's still having that clean heart. Subhanallah, how clean that heart must be, who's saying in that situation that, no, when they're doing salah, he's doing a great action. He's doing a great, performing great deed. Perform the salah behind them. Anyway, so at that time, Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he was reminding those people of some uh, uh, things that may prevent him, prevent them from attacking him, or shedding blood in Medina Munawwara, he said to him, Do you remember once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that who will give me that, uh, donate that land next to the masjid? Whoever will donate that land next to the masjid to uh, expand the masjid, I will I guarantee him uh, a replacement for it in Jannah. I will guarantee him a house in Jannah as a replacement. And I went that land belonged to one of the Ansar, I paid him the full price for it, and donated that land to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guaranteed me a house in Jannah for that land. And there were many other situations where he was guaranteed the Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was one of them. Anyway, this was, I mentioned this so we can uh, keep, uh, uh, we keep in mind, that this was at the time when they were expanding the masjid, during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it wasn't the initial construction, that was of course bought from Sahal and Suhay. But this was at the, when they were expanding the masjid, uh, Sayyidina Usman radiallahu anhu bought it from one of the people of Ansar and he donated that land. And that expansion was, uh, that portion was added into the masjid at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, of course the khilafah, the time of the khilafah was very short. And then throughout that time he was busy taking care of Murtaddeen and those people who have turned away, those who refused to pay the zakah, those who started claiming to be the prophets after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa sallam. So he was busy dealing with those people. During the khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu, they expanded the masjid even more. But Umar radiallahu anhu, all he did was he expanded the masjid on one of the sides. He did not want to touch the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he did not even touch the initial construction that was there from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the masjid was expanded or it was reconstructed during the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu and came much larger than it was at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. Then during the time of Al-Walid bin Abdul Malik he thought that now expanding it only on two sides as it as it's has been happening up to now will not work anymore. We need to expand the masjid from the side of the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahimahullah was the governor of Medina Munawwara at that time. So he uh, ordered Umar bin Abdul Aziz to uh, demolish all of those houses that were of the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then expand the masjid from that side. So that was the time when these houses were demolished and all of it became part of the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built the masjid, at that time he also assigned 
a small lot outside of the masjid, what that, that was called Musall al Janais, the place of performing Salatul Janazah. During that time, they would not perform Salatul Janazah inside the masjid. It was only once or maximum twice, if the other hadith is authentic, maximum twice that Salatul Janazah was performed uh, inside the masjid. Otherwise, normally, they used to perform the uh, Salatul Janazah outside of the masjid. This is why the scholars consider it performing Salatul Janazah inside the masjid as a makruh act, undesirable act, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would normally perform Salatul Janazah outside of the masjid. Whatever the reason, there are many reasons mentioned for it, but we know from the ahadith that there was a place outside of the masjid called Musall al Janais, the place of performing Salatul Janazah. And of course, Salatul Janazah has no rukur, no sujood, so it's very easy to perform Salatul Janazah anywhere outside. Therefore, it's always the best to have the Janazah outside of the uh, masjid. Sometime a question comes that then why nowadays? In the Haram of Makkah and Medina, they don't perform the Janazah outside, they perform Salat al-Janazah inside. Of course, we can very well understand that with the crowd that is there nowadays, if they will ask all the people to walk out of one of the doors of the Haram, on one side of the Haram, to perform Salat al-Janazah over there, it will be almost impossible to do the Janazah until the next prayer. And, mashallah, you go over there, you see that after almost after every salah there is janazah. So, people will be just throughout the day, they will be only just arranging for the janazah prayers, doing nothing else. And how many people then would be able to do it? So, of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing janazah inside the masjid once or twice tells us that if a situation arises, which is raining or something like this, and it's not possible to do it outside, it is allowed to do it inside. So, they're using that. Uh, that since it's allowed and it was done, so we are allowed, but the best is to, use, uh, to, to have it outside when it is easy, especially with our situations and the situations of our Messiah. It's very easy to perform Salat al-Janazah outside. It doesn't take too long for people to leave because, mashallah, our people are always in hurry to leave masjid anyway. So uh, it's easy to leave the masjid and, uh, and do the Salat al-Janazah outside. Umar radiallahu anhu, during his time, when he did the expect, uh, 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 when he expanded the masjid, at that time he added one more, assigned one more lot outside of the masjid, and that was so that if people wanted to talk, they should go out over there, out in that place, and talk over there, because he realized now people are having a different habit when they come to the masjid, they talk. Up to that time, they didn't have that habit. They would come to the masjid and read. They would recite Qur'an, they will perform Salah, they will be doing Tasbihat. They never experienced anything like that. But now, things are changing. As the well-known hadith about Umar bin al-Khattab anhu sitting in the masjid, and he hears two people talking. Huzayfa anhu says that, I was laying down and someone threw a stone on me. So I looked back, who was that? And that was Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He was the Amir al-Mu'mineen. I looked at him, he called me, he said, come here. He didn't call him. He didn't shout, Huzaifa? No. He throws a small pebble at him, so Huzaifa will look, who did it? Come here. He points to him, come over here. Huzaifa says, I want him. He says to me, look, those two people that are sitting there, call them, bring them to me. So I went and called those people. He asked them, where are you people from? I said, we are from Taif. Okay, you are lucky. Had you been from the people of Medina, I would have punished you very badly. And you know, he always would keep a whip with him. I would have punished you very badly. You raise your voice in the masjid of Rasulullah وسلم, Don't you have no respect? So they didn't experience anything like this. Now newcomers are coming into Medina who don't know these rules. They come there and they make all types of noise, shouting, everything else is going there. So he built a place outside. He said, now, if we tell people don't talk, they may just stay away. So here, if you want to talk, just go out there and talk, please. Nowadays, it's even difficult to tell people go out there and talk. They get upset. 
And then, not only that they get upset, they have a lot of fatwas too. A lot of proofs that look, this was happening in the masjid, that was happening in the masjid, and you're telling us not to raise our voice in the masjid. And our masjid is for everything, deen and dunya, everything. And all kind of fatwa are there. So, Umar radiallahu anhu, to stop that from happening inside the masjid, he built a place outside. He said, go and talk over there. So, this is really a good idea. Nowadays, people are used to building community centers. So, at least, if we would just develop that habit, within the community center, we keep a small place for salah also. But unfortunately, still we go and sit over there and do everything over there. Everything that is not allowed in the masjid, we will do it inside that place of the prayer, in the, of the prayer hall. So, if there is a big community center, there is place over there, at least we should have a habit. If anyone wants to talk, leave that place and go outside and talk. Go and sit in some of the other rooms and talk. Go to the gym and talk. Go somewhere else and talk. Why would you sit inside the masjid and talk about all of these things and make all the noise inside the masjid where people are praying? You're disturbing people who are praying, who are reciting, who want to do any ibadah. That is not the purpose of the masjid, of what you're doing here. The purpose of the masjid is the ibadah of Allah, is the dhikr of Allah, and that is the main purpose. And if those people are being disturbed in the masjid, then of course, the purpose of the masjid is not being fulfilled. <coughs> this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّمْ مَنْعَ مَسَادِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ Who can be worse than a person who prevent people from, you, from saying the name of Allah in the masjid? From doing the dhikr of Allah in the masajid. مِمَّا مَنْعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ They are preventing people from saying the name of Allah in the masjid. So, this is of course saying the name of Allah. Any type of ibadah that is going on and people are disturbing them through their talking or whatever else they are doing, is not good and it's not allowed. So anyway, talking about that history of the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar radiallahu anhu added that portion also and from there on, still we find in many different parts of the world. It continued after, up to now it continues. I have seen in different parts of the world, and if you look at the old Masjid, Masjid built during the time of Bani Umayyah, Bani Abbas, and those days, you always find that there is a main area of the Masjid, and then outside it, there is an open space over there, which is within the boundaries of the Masjid, but they don't, they, they did not make it as part of the masjid. So if anyone wants to sit and talk and chat and have anything else there, go and sit over there and do it. But leave the masjid, this section of the masjid, uh, of the prayer hall, for the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is really a good idea to have and to keep in mind when people are designing the masjid. Also, at the same time, it will help those who may not have the opportunity of doing the sunnah prayers, especially in our situations nowadays, homes are far away, doing the sunnah prayers at home, the sunnah should be the better place for the sunnah is at home. So if people cannot do it at home, uh, at least they, could, they would be able to walk outside of the masjid and do it in that section, which is not part of the masjid. So at least part of the sunnah is fulfilled that they are not doing it in the masjid, uh, as the sunnah is, uh, uh, is recommended, that not to be done inside the masjid. But again, as long as that situation does not exist, which means we don't have a room outside and other place where we can go and perform salah outside, then don't wait until you get to your home and do the sunnahs, do the sunnahs in the masjid. Because doing it in the masjid is better than not doing it at all. And this is what normally would happen. We will say, I'll, go, I'll do it at home. And we all know our situation. So, let's not go into that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we learn now that he built the masjid and this was one of the most important concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the time he arrived Medina Munawwara he was stationed in Quba for some days he built a masjid there he arrived Medina Munawwara he built a masjid there after building the masjid then they started building the houses next to the masjid this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa established that community. Normally, now our situation is, first thing we look for a house and then for a masjid. There, first thing is a masjid and then houses will come around it. The most important part of the community was 
having a masjid where people will always be able to go and perform salah. Now, of course, this masjid, even if it would accommodate all the people of Medina, of course it would not, but even if it would, it would accommodate all the people of Medina, Medina, in spite, in spite of being a small city, but it wasn't easy for all the people at the time of each and every prayer that would just come into the masjid from wherever they are. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not want people to break off the masajid. He wanted people to always be connected to the masajid. During his time, remember this, during his time, there were seven masajid in Medina Munawwarah. Seven masajid built in different communities. In fact, there is a hadith. Sahabatullah alayhi wa say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered us to build a masjid in every community. Of course, they would not do Salat al-Jum'ah. They all used to go for Salat al-Jum'ah behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and perform it behind in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the other prayers, they all would do it in their local masjid so that people who are working, farmers, whatever else they're doing, they won't have to just go all the way to the masjid there and come back after salah. It will take them some time. So uh, at least to have the uh, sense of the jama'ah and get the, have the importance of the masjid and of the jama'ah, they all had small masjid in their localities. And it's that there were seven masjid during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. And some ahadith have indication that they all used to establish salah under the adhan of Bilal radiallahu anhu. So Bilal, the adhan was won by Bilal radiallahu anhu and they all would hear it. This is how loud, how loud he would be calling the adhan. And then they all would be doing the salah in their own masajid. Very important, very important for us to learn this lesson from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the importance of the masajid, about making sure that we have masajid close to us and in fact we get close to the masajid wherever the masajid might be. Having been uh, living close to the masajid and we know that even if a masjid is only five minutes on a five minute drive, <coughs> The drive is not long, it's only five minutes, people normally don't come to the masjid. Only on a distance of five minutes drive. If it is on a walking distance, yes, something may pull the person to the masjid. Our weakness is weakness of our iman. And we all know it. We know our situation. And then still, if we are buying houses half an hour away from a masjid, of course, then how much are we going to be able to visit these masjids? And this is why our masajid are totally empty. Places where masajid are only within 5 to 10 minutes drive, those masajid are also empty, not just in our town, everywhere. Only those masajid that are only on a walking distance are the ones where salah and jama'ah is normally established. This is a lesson for us, for us to learn this lesson that in future, when we are looking for a house, we are looking, we are planning to move, it should be on a walking distance from a masjid if we really have the importance of the jama'ah and we would like to learn these lessons from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was the first thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized on, taught the ummah and uh, taught us this lesson from, uh, practically from his seerah that build a masjid Look for a masjid first and then have your residence around the masjid so that you can walk to the masjid. After building the masjid, the next question was, how are we going to call people to salah? Adhan was not established yet. Initially, people used to come to the masjid just by looking at the timing of the prayers. You know, they were very professional by figuring out the timings, looking at the movement of the sun. So, by that they used to figure out the time of the prayer and they would come to the masjid. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa of course there are no watches, so when he would see a good gathering, he would start the jama'ah. This is how jama'ah was established. Subhanallah, these sahaba really offered a lot of sacrifice. A lot of sacrifice. 
they are getting together just by looking at the sun, at the movement of the sun. And imagine, you know, uh, if a person is by coming by that, so one person will be coming now, another person may be coming 15 minutes later, because you can't differentiate so perfectly at the movement that you can say, oh, it's 15 minutes difference. So a person would come, another person coming 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, and the jama'ah would start after a masjid will be filled, as far as uh, Rasulullah sallallahu according to his experience, he knows how many people normally would come, and how many stuff will be there, so then when those many people are there, then he would start the jama'ah, people are waiting up to at that point, a lot of sacrifice. This is developing their iman, their faith, that is still they are leaving everything, they would come to the masjid. <coughs> but then, of course, the question came, that there should be a way of informing people that it's time for jama'ah, so all the people are able to come. And, it will be a reminder for the other people, for, for everyone, that it's time for Salah. Because many times people busy in their work may not, be, uh, may not remember the exact timing. And may not be able to look at the uh, movement of the sun at that time and find out the exact time of the Jama'ah. So, they had a meeting where they discussed this point of what method should be used in, to invite people to the masjid. Different opinions came. Some people said, how about we put on a fire? at a place when people will see a fire on a high place on a hill or someone we will assign someone to go on top of a hill and put on a fire so when all the people will see the fire they will know it's time for salah some other people said how about we blow a horn at the time of salah so all the people will know it's time for salah when they hear it some other said that uh, in those days the Christians used to use uh, two, tab two sticks Hanging them on each other, it, was, uh, it would ring like a, bell, uh, uh, like a bell. So why not use those sticks for uh, inviting people to the uh, salah? Umar radiallahu anhu's opinion was, <laughs> Why don't we ask someone to go around and start calling salah, salah, salah? This was another opinion. Anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't like most of those opinions because there was resemblance to some other people. And he wanted some unique way and method for inviting people to the salah. And so, the final decision was, at this time we will send Bilal, who would go around and start calling salah, 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 and then we will try to buy those sticks and uh, use them until we have a better way of calling people for salah. As they went back, all the Sahaba, of course, they are concerned about it. They had a meeting. They know that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is concerned about what method should we use. But one of these Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, when he went back home, he wasn't able to sleep. He really took it on, his, on himself. Then I have to think of a solution. I have to come up with some solution because this is something disturbing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and worrying him. So, because of that worry, he is worried now, and he wants to take all of that upon his shoulder. That I have to come up with some solution, and he's thinking and thinking and thinking. And he says, "بينما أنا بين النائم واليقظان إذ رأيت رجلا." While I was in a state of being half asleep, half awake. I'm not totally asleep. I'm not totally awake. I'm half asleep. I saw a man who was going with those two sticks in his hand. Then we decided we would get them until we have another way. So I called that man and asked him that, would you sell these sticks? He said, what are you going to do with it? He said, we are going to use it for calling people to Salah. So he said to me, why not I teach you something better than this? So I said, that's perfect. So that man climbed a wall that was there, and he started calling the Adhan. And after Adhan, he called the Iqamah. Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu remembered everything word by word. As soon as that vision, I don't want to call it just a dream, that vision is over, 
he runs to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His name is Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abdi Rabbi. He says, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I have just seen in my dream. Or in my vision, Bainan ya naimi wal yaqazan. Half sleep, half awake. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna hal ru'ya haq. This is a true dream. Teach these words to Bilal. Because his voice is louder than yours. So, you keep on dictating the, these words to Bilal, and Bilal will keep on calling them loudly. So, they started, that was the time of Fajr now. So, uh, Abdullah ibn Zayd is standing next to Bilal radiallahu anhu, and he says to him, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So, Bilal radiallahu anhu, loudly, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And continues the rest of the Adhan, he's teaching him, and Bilal radiallahu anhu is calling the Adhan. Umar radiallahu anhu heard it. He's almost getting ready to come to the masjid and he heard it. He ran out of his home to the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, I have seen the same thing in my dream. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alhamdulillah. That confirms what Abdullah ibn Zayn have seen. And of course, the real confirmation came from the words of the Nabuwa. It wasn't only a dream, but it just tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abdi Rabbi radiallahu anhu for this. And subhanallah, you know, Sahabi, that is normally is not even known. If you read the books of a hadith or anything like this, normally for general people it's not known at all. The name may not even have, any, many people may not even have heard the name. And even for those who study the books of a hadith, we may not have seen this name because it's not a very common name that you find it in the books of a hadith either. But subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this unknown man for this great and a very important ibadah that is continuing to be there and continues to be there from that time until this time and until the day of judgment, inshallah. Why? This is what he says. He says, فَأَهَمَّنِي لِهَمِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Because of the worry of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم about this matter, I was extremely worried. Look, this is the love that he had for Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and it worried him as he took it upon his shoulder. He couldn't do nothing more than this except just to think about it. That was all. But, Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what this man is going through. He knows what's going through this person's mind. Imagine when he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is almost the time of Fajr. And this is why he told him now just go and call Bilal. And it's by the time he called Bilal it's time for Adhan al-Fajr and he's calling the Adhan. And the whole night this man did not sleep. What prevented him from sleeping that night? That was the worry that let me come up with some solution so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have peace of mind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted that worry of this man. If we cannot do anything more, what a lesson for us. When many times we think and we like to talk for hours about our worries, if we cannot do anything more, at least we can do this. Have that worry in our mind that where we think what could be the solution to these problems. Whatever the problem is, the Ummah is facing this problem. The Masjid is going through this hardship. The community is going through the, these difficulties. There is a family that is having that hardship and difficulty. There is a sick person. There is this, there is, there is so many things. The least we can do at least have that worry where you can make some dua. Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. He is the one who will open the doors now. Subhanallah, there was no way Abdullah ibn Zayd could do anything more than this. He just worried about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just blessed him through that worry that he saw that and Although Umar radiallahu anhu have seen it, and he must have that worry also, and all the Sahaba had it, but Abdullah ibn Zayd was more than anyone else, and this is why he was the first person that went and informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umar radiallahu anhu came after the Adhan had started. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, and in one of the narrations, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar, why didn't you come earlier to tell me? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I thought I would come to you 
at the time of Fajr. And here, Abdullah ibn Zayd got ahead of me, and he took that advantage. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice there. So anyway, they started, from there on, they started calling the Adhan. Initially, of course, there was no uh, minaret on the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Bilal radiallahu anhu used to go on the houses of one of the Sahabiyyat. That was the highest house around the masjid. And he would go up there and call the Adhan. One of the points that scholars have mentioned about Bilal radiallahu anhu calling the Adhan, that this is a Sahabi who's known that he suffered the most. And during those days of hardship, the only word that was heard from him, Ahadun Ahad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him for calling that Tawheed over the rest of the people. And subhanallah, without going into any details now of the Adhan or anything like this, but quickly looking at this method that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for this ummah of calling people to the prayer is a very unique method. Very unique method. Compare it with ways of calling people to the places of worship or to prayers by any other religion. By any other religion. And you would find this method is totally unique. Where, as you are calling people, informing them of the prayer, but at the same time, you are doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, you are announcing the most important fact that are to be witnessed by human beings in the world. The shahada of la ilaha illallah and the shahada of Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have exalted your name. And here we find from that day up to this day, everywhere in the universe, in this world, there is always, whenever people are calling Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, they would call Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah with it. Allah have put his name next to his name, next to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when people are calling Shahada la ilaha illallah, they are calling Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah also. And some people have done that research on it and find that uh, you find something very unique about this Adhan, and that is hardly. Hardly there would be any movement in the world where Adhan is not being called somewhere in the world. Hardly there is a single second where Adhan is not being called somewhere in the world. In some places at this time, maybe the time of Salat al-Fajr. Some other countries, it's time for Zuhr. Other countries, is Asr. Then Maghrib, and Isha, and Fajr. And you look at the world, at the globe, and you start looking at the timings of the prayer, you will see that at all times, there are people calling Adhan, and not only the same Adhan. Some people are calling the Adhan of Maghrib at one place, and another part of the world, people are calling Adhan of Fajr. Third part of the world, people are calling the Adhan of Isha. And continuously is rotating and is going on and on. And from the time that Islam spread and started, and spread around the world, up to this day, this Adhan is going on continuously. Very amazing fact of this Adhan, that is going on continuously without a stop. Not only this, you may even look at it from another angle, and that is, just the Adhan of Maghrib. Because normally people call the Adhan of Maghrib at the beginning time, there is somewhere where ghurub is taking place. On a difference of few minutes between here and Toronto, for example. When we look at the schedule, it's about three minutes difference. So when, when the Masadis are calling Adhan over there, three minutes later, here in Buffalo will be calling the Adhan. And imagine there are how many Masadis between there and here. And then continues from here. On a difference of three minutes. And three minutes, you go up to New York, 15 minutes. Between that time, within these 15 minutes, people are calling the Adhan starting from here and take it 18 minutes from Toronto up to New York, people are calling the Adhan of Maghrib continuously. And every minute people are calling the Adhan. So, 
if you just look at that, at just the adhan of one prayer is going continuous. Imagine the adhan of all five prayers. So, very miraculous method of inviting people to the, this ibadah, and then at the same time, is a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so it's not just banging on something and bells or anything like this, it's a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for anyone who would hear it, would also be doing the dhikr in return, because, فَقُولُوا مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, that say whatever the muaddin says, and when he says, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala falah, we'll be saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So continuously, there is zikr for people who are hearing it too. As it announces the most important fact and the shahada of La ilaha illallah, shahada of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at the same time, it has invitation to the salah, hayya ala salah, and then at the same time, mentions the virtues of coming to the salah, and that is, hayya ala falah come to your success. We are inviting you, not just in a, to, towards a method or, or, of offering a worship only. No, this is your own success. You are coming to the masjid and accepting this invitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you will, face, you will see a lot of success in your life. Hayya al falah And again then, Allah Akbar mentioning the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and witnessing for the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, this is where and how the adhan started in Islam. Before that, of course, there was no adhan. (coughs) Although, there are some narrations that say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went for mi'raj, he heard the adhan. Or, when he was uh, in the heavens, he heard the adhan. Or when Salah established initially, and Jibreel alayhi salam came to lead the Salah, Jibreel alayhi salam called the adhan, all of those narrations are weak. There are all of these hadiths are da'if, and in fact, some of them are totally uh, fabricated. So, uh, the most authentic, these are the only authentic hadith that we learn about the beginning of the adhan, that was after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built the masjid, and they had their meeting, and then Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abdi, ibn Abd Rabbih radiallahu anhu, seeing that vision, and informing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about it, again remember, to keep it clear in our mind, that adhan did not start because of a dream, or because of a vision, it started because of the words of the Nabuwa, confirmation from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa authorizing them to call that adhan. After hearing the words of it, he knew that this is a true dream, and then he confirmed it, and he ordered them to call that adhan in this method. So that was the thing that started really established the adhan. The dream of Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abdi Rabbi radiallahu anhu was the initial step, but it wasn't the main thing that established this adhan in Islam. This is the reason I'm repeating this and making it clear, so that if today someone will see a dream or something like this, one thing that, oh, I have seen now another dream and we should call this now in adhan also. Or we should do this now in adhan or in that ibadah. No, 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 this won't work. It was because of the confirmation from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the second most important incident happened after the construction of the masjid. Inshallah, we will continue from here on and in our next session of what happened after this in the first year of the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina Munawara. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nisa'il al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.